sound was working, the film was working, and the only thing not working is you. <laughs> I'm allergic to it. <laughs> Sorry. Right, so My name are. is Gary Cox. Uh, I'm 84, pulling 84, pushing 85. Uh, and I never thought I'd make it this far. But I have, and I'm glad I have. And my wife of 64 years wow. has been with me most of that time. And uh, I live in Lafayette, Colorado. We're recent. Uh, we've been here two, three years now. And we lived in North Glen for 50 years, uh, 60 actually. And uh, when we retired, we moved here. And we, and we in Lafayette. One time, it's no big secret, I, I had a young lady who was living with us in North Glen, a friend sent out. Uh, she was having trouble in school and asked us to take her, to let her go to school out here for a while and try to get better. She got so homesick on Christmas and I had no money to send her home and her dad was an iron worker and didn't have money to send to have her sent home. So I, Carol's brother, my brother-in-law worked up for the Burlington Northern and I asked Bill if I wanted to jump a freight train and go to Illinois, how would I do that? And so he told me, he said, just go talk to the guys on down in the yard and tell them who you are and if you're not drunk and in their way, they'll talk to you, you're a working man. And so I asked them and they told me what track to be on at what time and it was a, a fast freight train. I didn't want to have to stop every stop. Uh, but they had what they called, I um, oh, forget, I'll remember in a while, but a hot shot, hot shot they called it. And it was a train that they would have things on that would spoil, like vegetables. And so it only made one stop between Denver, Colorado and Galesburg, Illinois. Galesburg being 50 miles north of where I lived. So. It was Lincoln. It stopped in Lincoln, Nebraska, to make a couple of changes and get some fuel on the in the locomotive. And so I rode the train out there, her and I. And it, and it was a beautiful day when we left Colorado, but it turned very, very cold. Mm -hmm. And the trainmen were worried about the young lady. She was only like eight or nine, and mm -hmm. and so they said, "Can we take her up in the cab?" And I said, do you want to go in the cab? Yeah, so she went, she rode most of the way up in the cab drinking hot cocoa and being spoiled while I rode back on the freight train. That was my <laughs> first experience with the freight train. But then I decided I, I was reading a National Geographic one day and, and my wife, who's also my good friend, and I said, boy, I'd love to see that culture. I was just amazed at the fact that we had such a culture that developed their own writing about the same time they did in Greece. And they had uh, developed city-states like they did in Greece. And I had never heard of it. What culture was this? Maya. Ah. The Maya culture. And it was, it, at that time, they were, the time that was, uh, we're talking at their time would be from the, the time they were in, in charge and had the power in Central America was 900 BC. Let me think maybe because I want to be accurate about this. It started about 900 BC, but they were in power from about 300 AD to 900 AD. About 600 years they were at their, the top of their the heap. Mm -hmm. And they ruled where now oil is so important, and who has the oil is the big shot. Down there in that area, water was the thing that everybody had to have, and it was in a short supply. There are no rivers in the Yucatan, hmm. very few. But what they do have, and what Florida is discovering, because it's the same limestone shelf underneath the Yucatan, and that area of Mexico as, as Florida is. It's mm -hmm. limestone shelf with s short trees. Anyway, I see, uh, and she said, she knows me as a, since I was a boy, that I just have a sense I want to see, I want to know, I want to experience, not just read. And so she said, figure out a way. And so my way was maybe I could ride a freight train. I've, I've done that once down to the Mexican border and cross the border. I knew six words of Spanish 
and get on the Mexican trains, uh, second class trains were a half penny a mile. And so I went 2,600 miles for $13 wow. on the second class trains through Mexico all the way to Merida in the Yucatan. Merica, Merida is the capital city town there. And the history of Merida alone is just magnificent. It took the Spanish 600 years to defeat the Maya Indians. Uh, they, they gave in very quickly in Mexico City, but not the Maya. They did not. And, but when, after they did, then they destroyed the Maya temples in Merida and took the stones from those temples and built churches. And so you can go to the churches and see the Maya writing on the site. But anyway, it's a wonderful city. You can sit in the plaza, which I did several times by myself. I was alone, uh, thanks to this lady who trusts me, and I trust her. We, we love each other. How long were you down there? I ended up staying longer than I thought, and longer than she thought I would. But, but I was sitting. I sit in the in the plaza, and there's a couple thousand years of history sitting around me in the plaza, mm -hmm. uh, if I think about it. And this little girl come over to me. She was younger than I thought she was, actually. She sat down next to me. She said, do you mind if I sit here, sir? And I said, no, I want to practice my English. And I said, can I practice my six words of Spanish? And you, will you help me? Yes, yeah. so we talked. And she said, I want you to meet my teacher. Come with me. So we went upstairs into the building that was just right next to the plaza. She introduced me. He said, this is one of the most bright young ladies I've ever taught. She said, that was 11 languages. Wow. Yeah, eight of them very well. And she's learning the others. Chinese is difficult. And, but anyway, just a... a they're very bright people, the Maya. That's one of the things that interested me when I read the book, how bright they are, how intelligent those people were, and how kind to one another. Uh, interested by this is not the same time, but later on I took my wife and some of my tax clients down to trips. Carol and I would get half of our trip paid by taking 10 other people down, mm -hmm. and they would help us with our cost us. So we got to go more often that way. And we left a group of people off there in Merida to go to the market. They wanted to shop. And Carol and I have this place where we like the ice cream. So at the, right off the plaza. So we went and uh, got our ice cream and went back down there and, she, and the lady said, these people are not friendly at all. I said, sure, they certainly are. What's the matter? She said, well, they don't even smile. So we said, let's go down. So we walked down there and immediately they broke out in a smile. And they said, what in the world? What did you do? And I said, smile first. It's an old secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> smile first. And then they know you're not out to hustle them. You're a friend. Yeah. Huh? Just let them know. Anyway, that's a side story. From there, I had met a young man on the train coming from Mexico City to Merida who had just got out of college. He'd gone to college in Mexico City. So you weren't, riding, you weren't riding in the boxcar at this point? Not at this time. I'm second class trains, which I love because that's where they bring the guitars and their tequila. Ah. Uh, I can't drink. I'm allergic, allergic to alcohol. My, I'm Irish <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so my wife told me early, you can be a drunk or a father. Take a choice. So I tried to be a father. I wasn't that great, but I tried. Uh, anyway, I like riding second class trains. And Carol found that why they would pass the babies around when the mother got tired and wanted to sleep and the babies wouldn't. They passed the babies around so she ends up holding these little babies, you know, and beautiful little dresses. But anyway, and then he said, why don't you come down to what is now Belize was that that time in 71 would uh, have been, this is 1971, would have been uh, it, it, it's now Belize was British Honduras. The British still controlled it, ran it, and it's one of the reasons I decided to go there because I felt more comfortable with the language. I could speak the language. And he told me to come and he lived 
as with Maya family on the Guatemala border. And they had their little 10 acre farm there. It was an ajito. Ajitos were land that the Indian tribes controlled. You couldn't own it if you were a tribe member, but you could farm it. You could take 10 acres, farm it, live with your family. As long as you farmed it, as long as you worked it. If you did not, they'd give it to another family. So this was the f what I moved into. Uh, anyway, he probably didn't think I'd show up, but I did. <laughs> I caught the bus and rode up to where he lived on in El Cayo, it was called, out in the jungle away from there, and I asked people for the family name, and they all knew them. And they lived on a river that runs right close to El Cayo, comes out of Guatemala. And uh, I lived with them for six weeks. Mm -hmm. I, no, I take that back. I was gone six weeks. I lived with them three, and I did traveling for three weeks. It took me three weeks to get back and forth on, and, and anyway, I lived with them for three weeks and got to know them very well, and found out later that the husband was a Maya shaman. Shamans, they have different kinds of shamans. Some shamans talk to the gods, some shamans are, med are doctors, actually. They do medicine, and that's what he was. He, he knew all of the drugs that came from natural plants. And so he actually, their sons told me that the American drug company sent people down to talk to him to find out what he used for what. And of course, they didn't get paid anything. They just took his ideas and took them back and patented them, some of them. Yeah. Uh, we, we our, our aspirin, for example, is just uh, it's an it's a, Indians taught us how to. I think it's white birch. I'm not sure willow. I'm not positive. Don't put any of this on your on your on your test papers. But it's a plant that the natives used to chew the bark, and it, we use it as aspirin. Hmm. I look at I'll, I'll Google it now that we have Google machines. Yeah. But anyway, that, that was my first trip. I, I, uh, I, I ran out of money. I, what I did was I took $200 and I took it with me and I told my wife I might get 10 miles, I might get 200. I have no idea how far $200 will get me, but I'm gonna go till I run out. And then I will leave $100 home, you send it to me, I'll make it home. So I wrote to her uh, for the money, uh, about two weeks ahead of time, mm -hmm. said I'm gonna come home. But I need, I'm out of money, I need money to come home. It didn't show up. So I figured she met some young guy, took the hundred, and she's gone, and I, and I wouldn't have blamed her at all. But what happened is I put a Mexican stamp on a letter from British Honduras. They went ahead and mailed it, but it didn't go by air, it went by boat, and it came to the house six weeks after I got home. Oh. So I had to call her because I got desperate. I was ill. I had to, I got the bad stuff, and uh, so I, I I called her and I said, "Where's the money, hon? I need the money." So she wired it down. I got it and I made it home on fifteen dollars. Spent eighty-five on them in Merida on clo on souvenirs. But I rode home on the freight again. Come wow. home dirty as a pig, lost uh, <laughs> thirty-five pounds. Wow. Didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm.